I am Jackie Flavin, Customer Insights Leader with Zemco. Thank you for watching our pilot episode of a series of videos where we interview experts about specific topics related to navigating the challenges that libraries and schools are facing in the wake of COVID-19. Today, I am joined by the incredibly delightful Kathy Farley, Director of White County Public Library. Um, a little bit about the library. White County is located in Central Tennessee, about 90 miles outside of Nashville. Is that, I've got that right, right, Kathy? Yeah. Yes. Um, and the library serves 27,000 with a staff of, um, is it 10? Staff of 10? 11. 11, led by Kathy. And I just want to briefly recap for our um, viewers and listeners all the awesome things that you have done um, since this pandemic started. So a little timeline. So we have let's see, the first case um, of COVID in Tennessee was March 4, and then schools closed March 18th, and the library closed to the public on the 19th. Stay at, home, stay at home order came on the 31st. So in that seven and a half, seven and a half weeks um, that you were closed to the public, your staff continued working in the building. Um, you have you offer tons of services during the, that time, um, including curbs, curbside pickup, virtual story times. You had eBooks for people that don't have a library card, printing, notary services, uh, power during a power outage, unemployment resources. Um, and then you even had an Easter egg hiding service and a peep diorama contest. I, I just loved reading all the things that you guys kept busy, kept you know offering for your patrons, um, and it's you know, just awesome. So um, we're so glad to talk with you today. You reopened on May 11th, and so um, we would just love to know how all that went and um, what you've learned from it, and what you would offer to to other people that are figuring out how to reopen their library. So maybe to get us started, I could just say. How did how did you decide to open on May 11th? Like how what what led up to the, to opening day? Well, our county is rural. We do not have many cases. Even right now, our total for the whole pandemic has been 33 cases. Out of 27,000 people, we have 33 cases. Most of those at this point have recovered, so we have not been hit hard like a lot of areas in our nation. So for us, reopening was more of a getting back to business, getting back to the way we do things in, in hopes of being able to give people needed services and allow people access to, to the building and the materials that we have here. Were you getting a lot of requests from patrons to reopen? Yes and no. Uh, we were getting vocal requests from the same patrons over and over again. <laughs> So <laughs> you, you know those patrons, you have them too. Uh, most of our patrons were, were happy with the curbside service, but a lot of them would say, well, you know, it's on this shelf. If I were in there, I could walk right to it. Well, tell me which shelf it's on. It's that one. <laughs> so, and I'm that too. I am very, if I walk in a building, I'm very directional. Well, you know, you turn, but I never know which hand's left or right. And I'm like, I don't that you turn that way and it's right there and it has red cover so we were getting a lot of those things that they if I could just come in your building we also were getting a lot of requests to use the bathroom <laughs> so well if you're used to stopping somewhere and using the bathroom uh, our UPS drivers our FedEx drivers all they have to go too <laughs> so the library is a safe place to go a clean place to go our bathrooms, we are really uniquely situated in our building. When you walk in the front doors, you're in our lobby area that has our bathrooms. So you don't have to go parading through the whole building to find the bathrooms. It's right here. So I know that's an odd thing, but yeah. being the public yeah. toilet is something we do well. <laughs> so you just have to embrace who you are. Maybe that's the best kept secret for everyone in, um, in Sparta, just so you know the library has the best bathroom in town. <laughs> the best bathrooms, we do. We're, we're known. I love that. Um, so how, what did you guys do to get ready to open on May 11th? How did you figure out all your processes and all that? Well, now, of the 11 people that work here, four are full time. So the four of us, kind of, we, we kiddingly call each other the brain trust. There's not really, and, and maybe between the four of us, there's a complete brain. But so the four of us sit down and we're like, okay, how do we do this and keep everyone here safe, which the staff here is the number one priority. Um, how do we keep the public safe? They matter to us too. How do we safely serve? So we started ordering 
plexiglass shields. We started getting masks. We started doing a lot of things like that that we hadn't done before. We started measuring on the floor and putting out tape. We moved chairs. Oh my goodness, we moved chairs. Our public access, the, just the whole floor, main floor of the library, had about 150 to 160 chairs before. Uh, right now, there's about 12. Wow. They're wow. not near each other. They're separated. Um, we make two chairs out of our computer center. We only have two computers up and going because our computers are way too close together. And that's one of those things when you're designing a building, it makes a lot of sense to have a technology center and have them in little cubicles next to each other. But now it doesn't make sense. And so here we are. And of course, our printer is in that area too. And people are coming in from the outside. You can access our network with your device and print to our printer from your parking space and we'll take it out to you if you don't want to come in the building. But if you want to come in, they're standing right there with those computers too. So that's really, normally our tech center has 24 computers and we're down to two. Wow. So that's been wow. a big adjustment. We've pulled all of our periodicals and we've closed off our genealogy room. Um, those are just, we didn't know how to sanitize those things between users. Right. So, right. okay, let's don't. But we're, we don't know how to do this. We're not going to spend hours trying to figure out how. Let's close off those areas right now. Our meeting rooms are not open. Um, I think that's about everything that, as far as collections that we've closed. We closed the, the genealogy local history room. We closed the periodicals. We shut down a lot of the computers. But we do carry laptops out to you, to your car. You can use um, our iPads to carry those out to your car. You have to give us your driver's license because we've played this game before. <laughs> so, but we'll take that to your car. It's already accessed to our network. You can print inside. We'll bring it out to you. Those sort of things are still going on that went on while we were shut down. So that's kind of a lot of furniture moved. Uh, we have benches in our entryway, and we just turned them around backwards where people aren't aren't sitting there, aren't gathering there. And did a lot of things like that to keep people from lingering. Right. Were you able to like just turn most of the furniture or did you have to like actually remove a lot of furniture from the building? And if so, where did you put it? It's in the meeting rooms that aren't being used right now. We carried uh, a lot of chairs out to the meeting rooms. We carried tables out to the meeting rooms. Some of the tables are used to block the collections that aren't being used. So we've moved that around. So we use the tables to block collections that are not accessible right now. Um, we've taken a podium out to the front lobby and one of our employees that are, uh, well, I'm going to say younger. I, I've been cautioned. My other employees have let me know that it's not fair to call them elderly. <laughs> called an age challenge. There's a lot of words they told me I was not to use to describe <laughs> them. But we do have some, I have an employee that's in their 80s. And I do not want that employee on the front line right now. I don't. Uh, that employee has a whole lot more risks than I do. So I stand out there. Now we're not open all of our hours. Normally we were open 60 hours a week. Right now, we're open 24 hours a week, and that's about what we can do. Um, we have three employees that are paid through National Council on the Aging Funds uh, through the Title V program. Uh, I cannot remember what the initials stand for, but the initials that we work with are CSEP, and I don't remember what program that is. But those employees have not returned. They are still getting paid but they're not back to work yet. That's not our decision. That's the decision through the National Council on Aging. Our janitorial staff is uh, from a group here locally called Paysitters that develop, uh, deals with developmentally delayed adults and mentally delayed adults. Mm -hmm. And they're not back yet. So <laughs> there's eight of us right now that are running the facility that are cleaning the facility, that are producing all the video content for summer reading, that are handling every state meeting that comes up that has to be virtually attended. There's eight. Wow. And it's wow. not easy. It's not easy. So it's kind of a relief when the door does open. 
right. and I go back to serving people. Yeah. Like, oh, you're here. Now, I can't do those other things right now because you're here. So I have to pay attention to you. Yeah. yeah. My shift every day at the door is usually about an hour and a half. Uh, when someone walks through the door, the first mm -hmm. thing we ask them to do, wash your hands. We don't have hand sanitizer. It, we can't find enough. We can't find dispensers that are no touch. We've had a lot of trouble sourcing things like that. So we, we're conveniently set up where the bathrooms are right there. We prop mm -hmm. open the exterior door. We prop open the interior doors. We prop open the bathroom doors. Yeah. Now the individual stalls and doors. Right, exactly. The individual stall doors can still be closed and things like that for privacy. But the, the bathroom is, as a whole is open for there's fewer touches. That's they go cool. in, they wash their hands. Once they do that, then they come on into the rest of the lobby. So. Has anyone had, have you had a hard time convincing people to wash their hands or are people mostly okay doing no, that? No, I haven't. But the funniest thing is somebody will leave something in their car and it happens every day. Somebody gets <laughs> in the building and they're like, I've left such and such in my car. <laughs> and I'm like, do you really need it? <laughs> well, yeah, well, you're going to have to wash hands when you come back in. Okay, okay. Hey, and, and they say, if the worst thing that happens to me is I wash my hands twice today, I'm doing okay. And I'm like, please tell me you're washing them more times than twice. <laughs> please, please tell me that. <laughs> so oh. it's, the public is still the public, and they're still very interesting to work with. Yeah, I'm sure. Before, before the pandemic, was your staff, like, was everybody focused on, like, kind of their area, or was everyone more of a generalist? Because it sounds like now everyone has to be able to do kind of anything, right? We've all been pretty good about anybody here can, can run the desk. Anybody here can check in and out books, can answer basic questions on the phone, uh, can handle, troubleshoot a basic computer issue. But we do have a children's librarian. We do have a teen services librarian. We have an adult services librarian. We have a genealogy library. And then of course we have the assistant director and me, we have a technology librarian. And we had front desk uh, workers as well. Well, now when the library is open, you're either a door grader or you're a front desk staff. That's the jobs right then. You, you're not, and we don't. We don't go to, to the stacks with people. We don't assist them in making selections. We stay out of their bubble. If they ask us questions, we help from afar. It's on the third row. No, the, the third. No, actually the third one, because you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah. To the left, no, your other left. <laughs> so, but we don't, we don't get close. We stay away. Um, that's been real challenging on the computers. Sure. It, the computers have been really hard because people were used to us helping them so much more than we're able to right now. And the unemployment system in Tennessee on the computers is a mess. And I don't think we're the only state in that problem. Oh, not at all, yeah. And the phone lines are jammed in most states the as well. The phone lines are unbelievable. I, um, I also, I'm also the executive director of the Tennessee Library Association as a, a side, and I was getting our new password for our wage and hourly reports that are due at the end of the quarter. I was caller number 1041 in the queue. Oh. I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> and I feel so sorry for the workers on the other ends of yeah. those phones mm -hmm. because they're, this is not at all the our Department of Labor has pulled everybody to answering those calls and trying to help people, but it's still, it's so overwhelming. Yeah. Right? And of course we have people walking in that have never used a computer that need to file an unemployment claim and the only way to file a claim is to do it online. So they need a lot of help. Yeah. That they're not really able to give right now because of the pandemic. So it's hard. It's hard. Um, we keep quoting a line from Beauty and the Beast because we're all a bunch of kids that hard are working. Uh, Lumiere sings in the song, Be Our Guest, that life is so unnerving for a servant who's not serving. 
Oh. And that's how we feel because we're so used to being able to meet these needs and be the place that you can come, that we can take care and we can't run. And it's hard and we have to constantly be reminded you can't touch their computer while they're sitting at their computer. You can't stand behind them and tell them where to click while they're at their computer. You have to stay six feet away from them. And it's hard. Yeah. It's so it, we're learning. Yeah. Yeah. Have we're fears learning. about, like, do you find, I'm, I'm finding, like, the more we go out with masks and stuff, I, I almost, like, forget to be afraid sometimes. Do you find, like, as the weeks go by, because you guys opened three weeks ago now, right? Right. Today, so, yeah. Today's yeah. a week. Yeah. So are you, are, does it feel like it's, like kind of almost hard to remember to be cautious or are you still able to keep that level of caution? We're pretty good but the people that come every day because we have those that barrier keeps sliding and sliding and sliding and I'm like hey you can't lean on my podium well, I'm, on, I'm on my podium okay if you need to lean on the podium that's awesome but I need to stand six feet away from you. so it's little okay. things like that that because again these people know they're here uh, three and four times a week, you know, they know us, they know our kids, they know our spouse, they know, are y'all going to the drive-in this weekend? Yeah, you think there's such and such as play? Do you know that you can only park in every other spot? They always have the hot tips. <laughs> like, don't tell anybody, but Walmart's got an inventory. You better go quick. Yes. So, it, little things like that, that they're part of us. And so keeping that physical distance between those people is it's hard. It's yeah. hard. So your memory really sounds like the heart of the community. Like we try lot. to be. Yeah. We try to be. If you're gonna be essential, if you're an essential county service, then you have to be serving. You have to be everything they need because they can find it anywhere else. They can find an ebook through Audible, through many of vendors out there that can buy it themselves. They can find a hardback book. They borrow it from a friend. They can buy it off Amazon. They can get it anywhere they want. They can find a notary at their bank, at their courthouse. Where they have to come here because we make the visit worthwhile. Because the people here care about them, because the people here are plugged into their lives, are part of their community, and are a part of their life. If you're not, you're not going to be a very effective library. You're not going to lead an effective staff. And in turn, your budget's going to look like yeah. <laughs> very, very different than what it needs to look. So I know bigger cities have the luxury of being anonymous. But when you're in a county like we are, when I'm at Walmart, I'm on. My smile is on my face. <laughs> Um, do you have this book in, honey? I don't know if we do or not. I haven't checked to see what come in this week. You, you can call them or you can call me on Monday. I'll be back at work. But I cannot remember. And let me tell you, when people see me at Floyd's, is our local grocery store, when they see me at Floyd's and they have an overdue book, I know. <laughs> Instantly, this look comes over their face and they're like, <sighs> Oh Lord, it's her. <laughs> and they just, you know, their countenance just drops. And you're like, I don't have a clue if you have an overdue library book. I have, you know, oh, it's not worth it. But or you maybe, like, you know, you know, if they check out, like, you know, kind of like, rom like a lot of romance novels or something. Oh, yeah. see, that part never occurs to them. I, I, and we are very, very stringent here about protecting that and again it's a small town it's a small town so we're real hard when we call and say that your book's here we never say hey Jackie 50 shades of gray is in <laughs> we say hello Miss Jackie this is the library and the book that you requested is here for you at the counter so we preach that constantly constantly to the staff. You cannot compromise people's privacy or we will not be a needed, required, wanted service much longer. Yeah. So yeah. we're very, very, very diligent about that. Right. That's one thing I do think we may be good at. Well, I hope we are. <laughs> Your staff sounds really wonderful. I mean, and they sounds like they've handled this, this whole crisis pretty well. And I'm sure it's a lot in part due to your leadership. Do you, 
like how do you, like is that has that been a um has leading them through this been like a a, a challenge or has like do you have any tips that you could share because I, I i am hearing that the relationship between directors and their staff can be kind of tenuous these days well the biggest thing that i've always I've, I've been the director here it will be 23 years in october so one thing at this point everyone that works here is someone i picked so if they're not working out it's my fault i chose them <laughs> okay i should have chosen them better and so my part right there i'm in it with them from the beginning because again i picked every one of them i have four full-time i have four county workers that are part-time i have three through the national council on aging and then the janitorial service has three part time. So that's how many there are of us all together. When we decided we were going to reopen, our board came in with us, our library board, and the staff, and we sat down. And I said, I'm ordering lunch. You're not going anywhere. I'm packing. Yeah. Woohoo. Yeah. You're all there. And they're like, Yeah, we're here for lunch. I'm like, No, we're not. <laughs> we're here to talk about reopening and how we do it safely. What scares you? Mm -hmm. Tell me, what are you afraid of? Okay. And, and I need to know. I need to know. I'm, I'm afraid that this person, you know, because we know our patrons. I'm afraid this person will be ugly to me because I'm wearing a mask. It's mm -hmm. and it will come back to you. Keep on. And we did. We made a list. We made a list of all of our fears. Um, mostly it was things like that. I'm afraid this person will do this. I'm afraid this patron who's used to doing this is not going to adapt to doing that. Okay. All right, let's get ahead of these. So we called our problem patrons. We sat down, we picked up the phone, and we called them. And I had a very lengthy discussion with one, but just we put it out there to him. Things are not going to be the same when you walk through the doors. Before, we have always been able to help you on your computer. We're not going to be able to do that now, to keep us safe, to keep you safe, to keep us all healthy, to keep our county headed in the right direction with our uh, illness numbers. We're changing a lot of things and outline the changes for you. Um, we talked among ourselves about what does a successful opening look like? How many people are going to walk through these doors? Um, how many people are we going to let in the building? How many people is too many people? Right. And right. we had a, so many conversations. We purposely opened on Monday and Thursday from one to five because our school system does free lunch distribution from 11 to one. So we were piggybacking off of that for the parents that could not pick up the homework packets from the schools come here and we can print those homework packets out. I cannot tell you how many homework packets we printed out. Yeah, that is so helpful. On Mondays and Thursdays especially because parents that were still working couldn't get to the schools from 11 to 1 for that drop pickup time. So we picked up the ball there. So I said okay our, our hours are set on Monday and Thursday. What, are, what do they need to be for the rest of the week? And another staff member popped up and said, we need to do an early morning. Mm -hmm. This patron comes in first thing in the morning because they get off of their third shift job at 7.30. We open our doors at eight. They're here weekly. So, okay, all right, let's pick early mornings. So we picked Wednesday and Saturday as our early mornings and decided, hey, on Tuesday and Friday, we'll do the middle of the day. And so what hours should be open was a process that we talked through. It wasn't me saying, hey, this is what we're going to do. I'll get behind me. I'm not that style of leader. Mm -hmm. I'm not that style of person. What, what's the best thing we can do? Let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. I and, love that. Well, and I don't expect them to do anything that I'm not going to do. Like I said, we don't have, we don't have janitors right now. You know who cleans the bathrooms at the end of the day? This girl. This girl. I, I have a day. Now, each of us have a day. I don't clean it more than others. I'm, I'm not, oh, I clean the bathrooms. But no, it's my turn. I clean the bathrooms. It's my turn. And so we've been doing it that way. 
uh, there's four hours that we're open, okay? How many hours do we stand at the door? Who's here today? Hour and a half for everybody. Divide it out. And yeah. it's, it's your turn. Are you out there? <laughs> I was told last week, uh, you know, we can't open the door to you to get out there. I'm like, oh, <laughs> am I the hold up? I'm so sorry. I was doing something else. I'm sorry. And they're like, yeah, it, we're kind of waiting on you. <laughs> so, but having that open dialogue, that, that willingness that they can tell me this. And, and a couple of things we tried at the beginning, they come back and said, hey, we need to change that. That's not working. Okay. Well, how do we change it? I don't know, but I know it's wrong. Okay. Well, after we close the doors to the public today, we're going to sit down again and we'll figure it out. Or we'll sit down in the morning if it's a late day and we'll figure it out and we'll change it. So it's been interesting. Yeah. Uh, we do not require the public to wear masks. Okay. We wear masks, but we do not require the public. And actually, uh, we have these very super cool shields now that we also are there a whole lot cooler than the mask. And I read on the internet this morning that they are 96 point something percent effective. Yeah. I was very happy about that. Yeah. But that, just a little thing like that changed our morale so much because whoever's on that front door, an hour and a half is a long time to wear a mask. It's hot. And people can't hear you and can't understand you. And that was <laughs> difficult. So getting the shields last week was a real, real morale boost. So good. I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of good that comes out of this. Maybe it'll take a while for us really to see all of it clearly. But there's so many bright spots. We're thinking of things differently. We're being more human to each other and prioritizing the right things. And how do you see your, your library merging from this? Like what are, what, what are the, like the permanent like good things that are going to come out of this for your library? Well, I think people will remember who was there for them when they needed us the most. We never closed. We never stopped services. Our services changed. Our services look different. Our building looks different, things like that. But at the core of who we are is still the same. Our mission is still the same. Our desire to be helpers is still the same. So you look for things in your life that are constant, that are consistent, quality things, places that you know you can go when things are wrong. Um, we had a man come in last week. Bless his heart. His phone, um, his, yes, it was a cell phone. His cell phone had been stolen. Okay, got a new phone. Whoever had the old phone was still using it, and it was still being charged. Oh, oh. He's a veteran. He has traumatic brain injury. Mm. It's very hard for him to focus through a conversation, much less through the process of what he has to do to report his phone as stolen. So he knows us, though, and we know him, and we have a relationship over the years. He knows he can come here. So he comes in and he's like, well, this is different. Yes, it is, but it's still the same. I'm still right here. Well, I'm glad you are, Miss Kathy, because I need you. Well, here I am. Wash your hands. Here, let's <laughs> talk. So he goes, he washes his hands and he comes back and he tells me this story. This unbelievably long for him to focus and remember this much, I knew this was hard, and it was weighing me. The phone's stolen, the chargers are still surmounting, and they're calling foreign countries, and it's big charges. It's not just, and they're going over the, the, all these things. And as well, have you talked to the phone provider? Yes. What did they do? They sent me an email. What does the email say? I don't know, but I can send it to you. That's great. Send it to me. Let me look at it. So we pulled it up. Here's a fraud report that he has to fill out. It has to be notarized. It has to be emailed back to them. Again, he's a traumatic brain injury survivor. Any steps that are required is more than he can do. But he needed to come and talk to me. And that we could walk him through what had to happen next. He said, do you have a police report? Yes, I do, he said. I know to report things that are stolen to the police. But do you have a copy of it at the house? I said, I 
I need it, okay? I need you to bring me the copy of the report, and then you come back, come right back. He lives five miles away. He forgot to come back till the next day. But he came back the next day, and I'm still at the door, and it's still me, and he still goes and washes his hands, and I printed off the paperwork, and we're ready to go. Only that day he forgot his ID. So I couldn't notarize it, but we got all the blanks filled in because it was a three page report. We got all the blanks filled in because I stood there and, and talked to him and filled in blanks, I made it work. He goes back and gets his ID. He remembered to do that that day. I can't believe I've left the house without my ID. I know that, I know to do that. And he comes back with his ID. We managed to get everything sent and they've got an email back from them on Saturday that is stopped. All the charges are stopped. And they're looking at doing back, going back to when he actually lost the phone and fixed it. Now, could somebody else have done that? Yes, yes. The bank could have done that for him. The courthouse could have done that for him. A friend could have done that. A child could have done it for him. But you know who did it for him? The library. The library did that for him. Okay. Now, I don't know what other libraries do. I don't know what your mission is, but if it doesn't take time to include instances like that, you're not serving your public. Mm -hmm. My public. All I can do is help him. He needs service. Even in the middle of a pandemic, he needs service. He needs me. Now, other places I could have. I was given an opportunity and we did. And that's what the difference is. When you're given an opportunity, do you rise to that occasion? Or do you slough that off to somebody else? Because it would have been easier to let somebody else do it. It would have been a whole lot easier for someone else to handle that. But that's not who we are. That is just such an incredibly touching story. It really brings a tear to my eye. I, I don't know. I, I know he could have gone elsewhere, but I almost don't see, I don't see those places embracing him and helping him with such care as you and your library. I mean, thank God for public libraries. And I know you know that, and I know that, but it, I just wish that everybody could hear this story because it's just so touching. I mean, he needed you and you were right there to serve him with whatever he needed. That is so wonderful. And that's what we're supposed to do. And regardless of your beautiful mission statements and your gorgeous facilities and all the things that you have, if you're not meeting people where they are, finding out what their needs are, assessing what you can do to help them, and then doing it. You're not serving the public. Yeah. Oh, that was so well said, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I really, this was so wonderful to chat with you, and um, I, I can't wait to share your story with more people. Oh, Kathy, thank you so much. I will um, let you get on with the rest of your day. I know the library is opening soon. Um, Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. We're glad to do it. Yeah, and I'll follow up soon in a little bit just to hear how things are going. I feel like I just love hearing everything that's coming out of your library. So keep up. We're hanging in. We're just, just hanging right in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. I'll talk Thank to you, later. Jackie. See you later. See ya.